Good afternoon, everyone. We're going to get today's broadcast started. Uh, my name is Henrik Bick. I'm part of the communications team at Music Biz, and I'm happy to welcome you to Creating a Sustainable Brand. Today's webinar is going to be presented by Legacy Entertainment Ventures' Brian Pennick, uh, and it's going to feature very insightful information on how for artists and artist managers to create a sustainable, engaging, and monetizable brand for artists. Uh, before we get started with the presentation, I just want to touch on a couple Music Biz related housekeeping notes. Uh, you might have seen earlier today uh, that we made an announcement regarding Nylon Connect 2020, our global music business summit taking place January 16th to the 17th at the Dream Downtown in New York City. Uh, we're excited to share with you that Kevin Lyles of 300 Entertainment will be delivering a keynote interview to open our label evolution track. Um, very excited to have him on the program and have him share insights into kind of how 300 developed into a artist focused label for the digital age and how record labels can advance to push forward music commerce going forward globally. Beyond that, we also made some announcements about other program additions, including an artist interview with singer-songwriter Pratik Kahad with his manager and the president of Women in Music, Nicole Barcelona, giving an artist perspective on the global streaming market. And we also ha added today Elisa Coleman, the newly announced chairman of the Mechanical Licensing Collective in the U.S., along with Karen Temple, the copyright registrar for the US Copyright Office. They're gonna be talking about the latest news on the Music Modernization Act and how it's influenced global conversations about music licensing going forward. For tickets, for hotel information and more program information, go to nylonconnect.com. And so you know, between now and November 22nd, uh, the Dream Downtown is offering a special rate for the conference of 219 a night. Uh, and you can access that through our website as well. Moving on to later in 2020, we have, of course, Music Biz 2020 coming up, our annual conference at the JW Marriott Nashville, uh, May 11th through the 14th. We have less than a month left with our open call for presentations. So if you're interested in submitting your thought out panel ideas that'll help to inform music commerce going forward or the music industry in general, we encourage you to go to our website, musicbiz.org. You'll find a section labeled Call for Presentations on the homepage and all the forms and guidelines that you'll need. Uh, call for Presentations, as I said, is open for less than a month. It'll be closing Monday, December 2nd at 8 p.m. Pacific time. And finally, for our virtual events, so you know, we have another four or five webinars coming up in our fall webinar series, including presentations from Sync Tank, Vistex, and Jaxta. We're very excited to welcome some new and familiar faces to the webinar series. So go to the education section of our website to register today. Now I'm going to put myself on mute and turn things over to Brian. We're really excited to have you on today. Uh, if you have any questions that come up during the presentation uh, that Brian doesn't necessarily answer right away, uh, please use the questions box on your GoToWebinar platform and we'll be addressing them all at the end of the presentation. Once again, thank you, Brian, and I uh, hope you all enjoyed today's presentation. Yeah, thank you very much for having me. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, hopefully, everyone can see my screen and hear me clearly. Um, you know, today we're going to be talking and doing a very deep dive on sustainability around what a brand is for an artist. Uh, this goes well beyond their talent into uh, their actual personal brand. Uh, we're going to be discussing topics that also extend into legacy, uh, which I'll explain that in greater detail. But in general, very excited to be here. Uh, the first slide here is by far the most exciting, which is the legal disclaimer. Uh, you know, information provided here does not constitute as any legal or financial advice and should not be taken as such. Please consult with the necessary professionals to seek advice in these areas. No liabilities accepted from the nature of this presentation or any associated parties. That includes both Music Biz, Legacy Entertainment Ventures, and any other associated companies. So that being said, uh, very excited to jump in here. Um, before I even jump into the foundation, I want to give a little context on myself and why I specifically am speaking to you about these topics. Uh, so I, I was actually a recording and touring musician for a little over a decade. Um, 
you know, had, had a lot of success in my career, met a lot of, you know, amazing people, some that are lifelong friends. Uh, but I, I always knew that my interest was uh, around helping others. So in 2011, uh, I retired from touring and recording, uh, started working with artists very specifically in early stage artist development. I did some uh, professional management as well. Uh, very fortunate enough to work with artists like Walk the Moon and Public, among uh, many, many others. Um, also have worked with a number of uh, large corporations and music uh, cobalt around their AWOL launch, Live Nation, and uh, you know many, many others. Um, and I actually launched a few startups as well in the education and licensing space. Uh, and luckily, both those were acquired. Now I'm working in venture capital. But the, the culmination of my now 20-year career in music is, is really focused around a few central elements, uh, very specifically around entrepreneurship, uh, sustainability, obviously, why I'm speaking about this today, uh, you know, brand empowerment, uh, education, and also gainful employment. Uh, and that's very specifically trying to help uh, artists and music professionals and students actually find pathways to monetize careers, but more importantly, again, sustainable careers. So with that being said, we'll go ahead and jump into uh, the foundation here. Uh, so this is a lot of very important reference specifically for this topic and this presentation. Um, you know, the talent that we'll discuss is a skill or trait for musicians that songwriting or performing, uh, but there is a very hard distinction, which we'll get into with the next slide, specifically around the difference between your talent and your personal brand. Uh, again, your talent is some sort of offering, typically a physical offering that you have. Your brand is your entire personal brand. And on the next slide, you'll see very specifically that talent is actually a component of your brand. Um, you know, with regard to legacy entertainment ventures, which we'll get into specifically what we do here soon, uh, we say that your brand is what you represent and your legacy is the impact of that personal brand. So there's a clear distinction there as well. Your legacy is not just after you're, you're, you passed on what some people interpret. Uh, it's really about the overall impact of your brand and utilizing, you know, whether it's sponsorship endorsement or licensing, we'll get into all those or actual investment, but it's leveraging your personal brand, which again, incorporates your talent as well. Um, organic alignment, you'll hear me use that term a lot. Uh, it's the natural alignment between two parties, whether that's, you know, an artist and their personal brand with their fans or, you know, that personal brand with a third party company, which leads me directly to the next uh, explanation, which is you know, a company is a third party. It could be a startup, small business, corporation, whatever, uh, that's providing a good or service. Uh, and then finally, the perspective that I'm offering here, uh, certainly I hope to not sound too robotic, uh, but at the end of the day, this is objectively speaking uh, and purely for, the, for business purposes, um, certainly you know, understand and take into this a very serious consideration that especially an artist's talent and their brand is extremely sacred and that the bond between the artists and their fans are also, it's, it's extremely important. And it's not just looking at it purely from a monetary gain, purely looking at it from an objective standpoint, uh, absolutely uh, subjective you know, consideration is given. But for the sake of this uh, conversation and presentation, I'm gonna be speaking extremely objectively. So that being said, we'll go ahead and jump into personal brand versus talent. So there is a, a very clear distinction that I'm going to make drawing a line in the sand between these two. There's a lot of crossover between them, a lot of similar terminology that we'll use, but there is a very specific carve out when it comes to your talent versus your brand. So your talent is quote unquote what you're offering. Again, that's typically a skill, whether that's songwriting, performing, this extends well beyond musicians, you know, to other forms of, of artists, but obviously for context, we'll keep it to music. Um, you know, that includes your image and likeness. You know, I saw a lot of the attendees here. Uh, there's multiple attorneys, uh, managers, you know, it goes well beyond just the artists themselves, which is great. Uh, but when we speak objectively here about talent and we refer to things like image and likeness, that's purely based on your talent in the context of your music. Uh, and then also that extends to the associated revenue streams there is a distinction outside of your talent when it comes to your brand, which is what you represent. And the personality and personification of you know, your brand is, is typically, a good way to look at this is your music is what will draw someone in and make them interested. Your brand is what will keep someone engaged. You know, when it comes to basic consumption from your fans, your audience, you know, they're not just coming to your social media to see new music that you've released, to see when you're gonna to be touring, to see merchandise, you know, things like that. 
they're very interested in especially your personality, but again, the personification of your brand itself and what it represents. So, um, you know, there, there are absolutely opportunities when it comes to utilizing that image and likeness outside of purely your talent when it comes to your brand. We'll get into those specific distinctions. And then there's obviously non-talent revenue streams that are derived from that as well. Uh, we'll discuss that. Uh, these are a lot of, you know, uh, basic concepts that we're also exploring in a, a relatively new way when it comes specifically to uh, artist-based venture vehicles. Uh, I'll touch on that a little bit, certainly not trying to push that service here, uh, but you know, there, there are some lines that are not necessarily blurred, but contextually being redefined with some of our conversations. Uh, and at the end of the day, it's gonna provide a lot more sustainable outlets and opportunities for artists. So uh, a great example here, I mean, there's many to name, uh, Jay-Z is uh, a, a great point of interest, comes up in a lot of conversation. Uh, when it comes to his distinction of his brand outside of his talent, his personality and his personification of his brand, again, beyond just an artist, is an entrepreneur. He's a very successful entrepreneur that has stemmed into investing as well. He has multiple different investment entities. Uh, you know, I have revenue down here as Rock Nation, Marcy, Marcy Ventures, Rock Aware, things like that. Uh, but, you know, going to his image and likeness, again, outside of his talent, it's all about personal empowerment, you know, coming from the Marcy Projects, which is why I named his venture uh, fund that, you know, he, he talks a lot about, you know, empowering people that he's done it, you know, providing an outlet to inspire others to do it as well. Uh, and obviously that's incorporated into his lyrics, into his talent. Uh, but again, his revenue stream, which unfortunately I don't have these figures uh, up to date in front of me but his, his talent is just a very small fraction of his overall annual revenue and his uh, brand outside of his talent derives significantly larger multiples than the talent itself. So very simple infographic here on the right, your brand is, uh, I should say your talent is, is a component of your brand and not vice versa. Uh, so that's one thing to remember as we go through this presentation. Um, when it comes to sustainability, we're talking more specifically around the financial aspect of that. Sustainability when it comes to contextual relevance of an artist uh, presenting themselves to their audience, um, you know, finding those points of interest to maintain, you know, amongst new artists coming out against, you know, the lines of genre and albums being blurred. Um, those are certainly a part of this, but when I talk about sustainability and independence, it's much more from a financial perspective. So uh, we'll lean into this now. When it comes to financial stability, you really derive um, you know, your revenue from two different categories. One is active income, another is passive income. Uh, as you see here on the active income, which we'll go through all these, this very specifically pertains to album cycles. Uh, when artists are active, and this doesn't have to be a specific you know, album uh, collection, an LP of, of music, it can be a standalone single. It's more around a promotional campaign is a better way to generalize this. But when it comes to active income derived specifically from your talent, it's typically a service base that requires an action. So when you look at releasing music, and this en encompasses everything from the concept to the actual you know, uh, application of writing music, recording it, and then promoting it, those are all service-based you know, areas to where you physically have to you know, either perform or provide a service and it does require an action. Uh, releasing that music, obviously, there, there's there's timelines that are extended around uh, promotional campaigns, album cycles. You know, we're, we're traditionally you know one and a half to two years, depending on the success of the album, on average. So, you know, if you look at what's known as the bell curve, that would be the peak of the bell curve when you are very prominent in the visible spectrum, when you have uh, a lot of promotional and marketing efforts around your music. That typically would include a tour. That typically includes merchandise. Uh, or you know something that that is a, a consumer good that's being sold, um, and for sake of conversation, that's also very actively when when synchronization is happening from a licensing standpoint for your music. Uh, you know there are obviously artists, you know possibly even some on this uh, on this webinar that have had you know back catalogs uh, you know placed as far as syncs go, and that's great. But I'm I'm talking more contextually about. You have new music that's being released. You have music that's being pushed. You have music that's you know gaining traction uh, within that specific album cycle. So when it comes to active income, again, the things, the main things to take away are that it relies you know predominantly on your talent, and it does require some sort of specific service. Passive income is something that 
Um, unfortunately, it's not discussed enough when it comes to music. And obviously, everything on the left column applies to the right. Your music is going to generate some form of revenue over time. You know, when it, you're not on an album cycle, when you're at the bottom side of a uh, of the bell curve. And also, you know, you're, you're going to play sporadic shows. Your merchandise will sell. Hopefully, that catalog placement will happen, you know, even for recent album cycles. But what I'm talking about is more specifically things that, you know, do not rely so much on your talent, but more so rely on the brand. So this is thought of, you know, contextually outside of music, but absolutely, you know, it holds its own in music as well. Something that is paid potentially on a recurring basis or, you know, automated, especially when you get into uh, to utilizing technology. If you're familiar with what's known as a SaaS platform, which is software as a service. You know, it's taking a service and automating that process so there's not a physical human doing it. That does apply here. Uh, I'll get into a specific example of that further on. Uh, but again, it, it's it's not requiring you to be very physically active for that actual revenue stream. Uh, it, it's looking much more to reoccurring or passive, but again, non-action oriented. Uh, the other main component here is that it relies on your personal brand. There's obviously crossover from your talent again to the passive side, but you know, contextually speaking, we're referencing more specifically the brand. Um, very common scenarios here are sponsorships, brand licensing, and endorsement. You know, a sponsorship is where you're actually aligning uh, with a good or a service and, and, and promoting that to a certain extent. You know, th th there is a distinction between a sponsorship and an actual endorsement. Um, but in, in the scenario of the sponsorship, you know, we're, we're seeing um, uh, sponsorships happen around, you know, especially social media. Um, which the the FTC ruled several years ago that now you have to actually put the hashtag of an advertisement to disclose uh, when a sponsorship or an endorsement is happening. Uh, there's many more scenarios beyond that. We'll get into all of that. Uh, when it comes to licensing your brand, your likeness, there's a lot of scenarios. Uh, you know, on, on the venture side, um, the the partner for Legacy Entertainment Ventures is Loud Capital. Uh, it's heavily investing in uh, in CBD. Uh, when I talk to, you know, talent or their teams when it comes to investment scenarios, which is, again, what we do with Legacy Entertainment, CBD comes up in every single conversation. Uh, while there are absolutely great opportunities for third-party companies that are looking to align with talent to essentially just put their face on a product and then pay them either on a single or a reoccurring basis, uh, there's, there's also the opportunity to, for those artists to, to actually invest in, say, the supply chain, which we'll get into that in a second. Um, so when it comes to sponsorship, brand licensing, or endorsement scenarios, um, those are most common. When it comes to passive, uh, those typically include a third-party company that uh, could be handling the marketability. It could be outsourced to a, a secondary third party. It could be handled by your team. Uh, and the last category here, which is you know I, I've touched on very briefly, is investing. It's actually looking at the scenario of okay, I have an established brand. There's obviously a value to that brand. How can we monetize that brand, not only from a one-to-one -one scenario, say through a sponsorship licensing or endorsement scenario where, you know, you're being paid out from a third-party company to put your face on something for, you know, maybe an appearance uh, or some sort of association uh, or being even paid when your fans engage with that product, again, on, on like an affiliate side. Uh, but the investment scenario is really interesting uh, because it allows you to move beyond that one-to-one -one relationship of actually seeing a return when your fans engage with, you know, across, again, sponsorship, licensing, or endorsement scenarios to where you're investing at the root of the solution. So at that point, it becomes a one-to-many scenario. And there, there's a lot of restrictions around investing. There's certain uh, individual high net worth uh, that you have to, you know, be approved when it comes to the SEC. Uh, but at the end of the day, you know, investing is absolutely a great solution. You know, it, it's certainly something that, you know, everyone could and should consider if, if they, they are able to objectively meet that point. Uh, but you see that value of one to many to where it's not just you're seeing some sort of a windfall passively for income when your fans engage with the product or service. It's more the mentality of when any fan or any celebrity engages with a product or service that you've invested in uh, and you, you're actually seeing a return from that. Um, I did pen an article recently in Billboard and I, I do elaborate that. Uh, towards the uh, the bottom around a celebrity investment scenarios that articles called uh, five music tech investment areas you need to know. Um, but all of this being said, there are some inherent problems when it comes to you know really the perspective of artists and ar around sustainability. Um, again, leaning into those active income scenarios, uh, 
considering changes in the market industry trends, you know, competitive landscape. Um, the, these are major, major factors. But it, at the end of the day, you can't tour forever. You know, you, you can't tour 12 months out of the year. I mean, there are physical limitations, mental and emotional as well. Um, you can't constantly be releasing music. So again, traditionally, when I worked with artists, uh, I, I saw the, the very active perspective was the only one that was taken. And also when it comes to general entrepreneurship, you know, you have personalities that are influencers. Gary Vee is a very popular one. They talk a lot about passive income streams, but unfortunately that hasn't really trickled into the music industry. These are absolutely areas to consider. Um, the other thing that's not really talked about when it comes to really career planning, you know, wealth management, things like that. Um, it, it's amazing coming from bands that toured extensively, uh, you know, from my own projects, uh, seeing people uh, it, that were, were getting to a certain age when they wanted to start planning for a family or retirement was something that rarely came up, you know, even, you know, when, when my bands were doing well, or, you know, especially my clients uh, were, were doing well when I was working on the servicing side. Um, these are long-term areas that really need to be considered. And again, quite frankly, are not discussed enough. Uh, again, you can hit peaks in your career. Uh, the average age uh, of a uh, someone on, on the top of the billboard charts as of 2018 was uh, 28 years old. Uh, the average age of an athlete was 26 year old. Uh, that was at the peak of their career. Uh, Esports gamer was uh, 25. So there is a lot to be said when it comes to long term career and wealth management planning that again just needs to be uh, discussed more in general. So sustainability obviously plays into that. Uh, but we'll go ahead and move beyond this. So uh, when it comes to looking at these scenarios from active to uh, passive income scenarios, before you can make any connections with a third party company to start to tap into, again, sponsorship, endorsement, licensing uh, or investment scenarios, you really have to understand both your personal brand, but also your audience. It's extremely important to consider, again, speaking very objectively, that your, your audience is made up of a base of consumers. They are, again, brought in typically by your talent, uh, but they have more consumption habits beyond just music. These, you know, everybody has to eat, everyone has to drink, everyone has to have, you know, clothing, shelter, basic necessities. But when it comes to, you know, knowing your audience and those commonalities, uh, one of the most important questions to ask yourself is, how well do you know your audience? Uh, in addition to that, the next natural question is, how does your brand align with your actual audience? So some very similar characteristics that you can start to compare, and we'll go through basic to advanced and then some extremely detailed. Um, I've worked with a lot of you know, high-end artists to break down these categories. I've worked with companies to look at this. Uh, this term is also known as, as basic lead intelligence, but you know, contextually speaking, this is much more around your audience. So basic you know, characteristics. Uh, are around you know age, location, you know to some gender and ethnicity are important uh, just to get some sort of makeup and understanding, uh, and that's great if if you at least have that context. That's important. Uh, jumping into what's much more advanced again, something that a lot of artists are seeking, or you know like social media preference when it comes to what networks, uh, engagement frequency. You you probably have some basic understanding with your artists. I'm sorry, with your fans rather about you know what social media platform works best what times are you know of uh the optimal uh to, to post or engage with your audience um you know also looking at similar artists that play in the space not necessarily just from a talent side but also from especially a brand presence side uh, when it comes to social media i have uh, with our education platform musicians desk reference uh, we have a component there that's called a case study which leans very heavily into research typically around when you're looking for a manager, booking agent, things like that. And it's really a qualifying mechanism and process so that when you do engage with those third party professionals, you have some historical context on who they are, what types of clients they work with, you know, what their preference are, your preferences are when it comes to, you know, identifying and securing new talent. But one of the most overlooked yet most important is a case study when it comes to uh, personal brand and social media. Uh, so there, there's an extended template in there uh, and this is something you don't necessarily need our template for, but just really considering similar artists in your field, again, not only from a talent perspective, but how do they engage with their fans? You know, what, what networks are they using? What's the engagement frequency? What tactics are they using? Uh, and, and getting a sense of that and staying current with it as well, because there's always going to be new talent and there's always going to be improvements to existing talent. Um, and then these, these next characteristics jump in from uh, the work that I've done with, again, both artists and corporations, but it's extremely important 
uh, to have context here, especially when you, you are looking at the alignment of uh, potential sponsorship, licensing, endorsement, or investment scenarios. So basic consumption habits, uh, you know, certain fans, you know, have uh, specific brand loyalty. Um, brand loyalty is something that's very interesting because it's absolutely a tactic that's utilized from, you know, successful brands, but identifying loyalty, I mean, I'm sitting here right now, I have an Apple phone, I have uh, an Apple uh, mouse, an Apple laptop, I have Apple accessories that I'm using, you know, I, I'm loyal to Apple, not necessarily saying it's the best brand, but it's just something that I personally have become very familiar with. So, you know, there have been studies shown, and, and we've done some work in this space as well, that even when it comes to stock photography, when you're advertising something, having you know, some idea of the segmentation and persona of your audience, you know, if you're promoting to a predominantly uh, Apple-based crowd and, and, you know, you're using PC products, there's some sort of separation. Uh, and that also extends into anti-brands, you know, that can be just based on preference, that can be on ethics, that can be on religion, that can be on a lot of different areas. But knowing what brands from a consumption standpoint your fans are loyal to, but just as importantly, if not more importantly, what brands they do not want to align with, you know, having uh, an artist that is a part of the LGBTQ plus community, uh, you know, that artist, if they're seen taking a picture, you know, eating Chick-fil-A, uh, that, that's probably not going to be a scenario where their fan base is, is very interested uh, and engaging, especially if it's, you know, contextually a sponsored or a post or an endorsement of a product or service. Uh, you know, again, speaking very objectively, I know that's a, that's a hot topic for discussion. Uh, but buying ethics, you know, are a very real thing. Uh, you know, it, it's it's amazing, you know, looking at so many uh, studies, which, you know, I technically do fall into the millennial uh, generation. I'm, I'm one of the eldest millennials, but um, millennials and Gen Z especially are, are two of the most ethical generations out. Uh, they provide uh, much more conscious decision uh, application when it comes to consumption. Uh, when it comes to like social impact and giving, uh, they're, they're absolutely two of the most generous uh, generations out there. So those ethics absolutely do play in. So, you know, looking internally, self-reflecting and also seeing what aligns with your audience. Um, education is something that plays largely into uh, when it comes to marketing promotional campaigns, but also looking at the actual content itself. Um, you know, it, it's not so much that, you know, one of these categories is better than the other. It's just having an understanding um, you know, of your audience, you know, do these individuals uh, have some sort of, you know, GED or, you know, high school, uh, you know, equivalency, uh, or do they focus on trade schools, you know, do they have a high school education, college, graduate, doctoral, you know, any of those things, uh, having that context, especially when you get specifically to markets, um, even something is as simple as, you know, when you're playing, if, if you are an artist, and your brand is, you know, promoting instrumentation or, you know, uh, really leaning into the talent side. You know, I worked with an amazing artist uh, that that uh, pushed um, sitar combined with uh, electronic uh, music, and and he went to Berkeley. He was the first one to actually major in sitar performance at Berkeley. So every time the band played in Boston, there would be a massive gathering of uh, of people who were interested very specifically into the sitar. So while it was absolutely a part of his talent. We leaned into that on his brand because they were one of the most unique, uh, you know, presentations of using a sitar. But again, he was the only person to master uh, to major in that at uh, at Berkeley while he was there. You know, employment uh, is another very interesting, you know, aspect here. Uh, the hour hourly salary, looking at you know uh, disposable income, it's always you know important to remember that with fans. So if if you are you know a DIY artist and for some reason you decide to push a luxury brand. Uh, that might not necessarily match with your demographic, not saying anything negative about your demographic, but uh, at the end of the day, again, making sure there's very organic alignment. Um, something that's really, really significant that I found over the years is actually looking at the schedule of employment. You know, are these, are your fans typically more corporate or are they nine to five or are they more service industry, six to three, things like that. Uh, so it's really important to have that context uh, this can apply to, you know, their avail availability to come to shows. If you look at like the seasonal or annual employment, you know, uh, if a lot of your fan base seems to work, you know, things like retail and they're very seasonal, that might not be the most optimal time for you to tour. But also when it comes to these, uh, you know, uh, sustainable brand components for sponsorship, endorsement or licensing scenarios, you might want to shy away from that because obviously those individuals are inundated 
uh, you know, what influences their decisions? Is it family, is it politics, religion, environment, you know, their actual employer um, that, that gives them the, the freedom to, uh, you know, consume independently or at least to be vocal about it. Uh, and then just to wrap this up, distractions are always a very important part here. You know, sports holidays, um, you know, looking at the correlation of, say, like a country music artist. I have some friends that tour in very large packages. Uh, those tours typically don't happen around, you know, massive events when it comes to uh, like the Super Bowl or the World Series or things like that. Uh, a lot of those tours are done off holiday season or off sports season uh, and pop up at other times. So just having all of this audience intelligence is only going to provide you more value when it comes to the sustainable, you know, brand perspective, but also just really, you know, having having more understanding of, of who your consumers are. Uh, and the summary here, just to take all that, you know, uh, text and put it into something visual. The organic alignment that you're looking for is between your brand, your audience, and your influence. So there's a lot of crossover at the top here between your brand and your audience. You know, when it comes to utilizing your influence, that's absolutely a part of it as well. But looking specifically at that, you know, inner cross section is extremely important. And having this contextually to inform the decision once you have the intel from your audience when it comes to especially the third parties that you're aligning with and also how your influence will translate when it comes to you know, engagement with those third-party products and services is extremely important. So this is something that you want to, uh, to really focus on. Um, you know, another thing that is important to consider here, you know, a, a lot of these areas that are being discussed, you know, some of you might be asking, well, this is something that only someone, you know, I mentioned Jay-Z, so the ultra high net worth individuals are the 1% uh, can utilize, and that's absolutely not true. Um, you know, you may be familiar with the term micro influencer, uh, and it's typically looking at somebody who has so a social media following of, you know, some people categorize it uh, between 10 and 250 thousand based on the individual platform. Uh, but this is not the one percent. This isn't even the entire remaining 99 percent. To a certain extent, this is, you know, what would be considered the base or the introductory one percent, uh, it, it, the uh, the base of the pyramid, if, if you will. So when it comes to micro influencers, there's a few very important components to remember here in general. Uh, it's extremely cost effective for a third party to engage with a micro influencer. Everyone's, you know, vying for the Taylor Swifts, the Kylie Jenners, you know, Beyonce's, whomever. Uh, but those individuals have a, a, an actual standard when it comes to historical context on what they're charging for to align their brand. And working in an unstandardized area of this industry is actually a, a big positive. Uh, because you really get to set more of your own terms in the price. Uh, you have a lot more flexibility, which we'll get into as well. But in general, this also scales down to the hyper-localization, which we'll get into in a second. Um, but when we look at uh, the benefit of you know, smaller artists, and this also applies you know, to a, a local and a regional level of engaging with a third party across any of those sponsorship, endorsement, or licensing scenarios, uh, from a company perspective, it's less per transaction per influencer. So that's a huge value add. Uh, when it comes to micro influencers as well, uh, and engagement is typically much higher than visibility. Uh, engagement is specifically somebody interacting with some sort of you know, uh, relationship between a personal brand and a third party company. Um, these are scenarios where the visibility is not as high as, again, that top 1%. Uh, but the engagement derived even from a local band on marketing campaigns is substantially higher uh, than that when it comes to uh, those of national campaigns. Those typically, uh, you know, and historically have targeted the visibility and hoping that the artist will, you know, push as hard as they can or that the nature of the interest from the audience to the artist will translate to the third party company. But that's not really true. And we're in this huge paradigm shift, you know, over the past, especially five years to where you know, sponsored content has you know, worked in some regard, not necessarily worked in other regard, but now uh, these companies need engagement. They need to prove that the sponsorship, the advertising dollars, you know, the influencer marketing is working, so it leans much more to the engagement. But what a lot of these, these companies are seeing is that actually aligning with earlier artists that have more dedicated fans uh, are, are producing a lot higher engagement rates. Um, there's a very specific report that came out from the uh, expert, uh, the, the Kelly Face survey um, that specifically states, and I use this in my billboard article as well, that 82% of consumers engaged were more interested when it comes to micro influencers than that of macro influencers, and 82% is against that of 73% of the peer to peer. 
So what that means is if you know a friend is just referring you know another friend to a product or service that's typically seeing about 73% engagement within very uh, closed garden uh, engagement scenarios. But if somebody has some sort of influence yet they're not the top one percent, that yields a, a higher response from consumer engagement, and that's extremely important. They didn't have a lot of context around macro influencers, but uh, you know if you can see uh, a few solid percent. Uh, in general, that's actually good, but obviously the visibility is much higher. Um, and the other thing to talk about here is the scalability and flexibility. Uh, multiple campaign, you know, variations having uh, maybe one brand that's trying to launch in, you know, 50 different states and five markets in each state. They can elect to work with individuals in those uh, communities and markets that have a much higher uh, natural engagement rate because that's where they're based and that's where their initial and core demographic fans are. Uh, so they can get into variant testing, demographic testing, segmentation, things like that. You know, uh, for states one through ten, it can be a different campaign through states, you know, eleven through twenty. Um, they can work with different artists. So, at the end of the day, the scalability and flexibility from both the company perspective is important, but also from the artist because you also get to typically have more of a say from a micro influencer standpoint on how these campaigns are governed. So it's not necessarily a macro campaign to where someone, you know, a company steps in and says, I want an artist. It can be artist ABC, XYZ. It doesn't matter. I just want someone to fulfill this predetermined marketing role. Uh, but you're looking for something where you can actually have some creative input because from a talent and brand perspective, if you can have some influence on the campaign, you know your fans better than this third party company does. So it's extremely important. And again, in general, musicians are an untapped micro influencer market. So uh, to summarize this, you know, content creators plus the hyper localization is the benefit for an unstandardized market. So I do, uh, you know, encourage you to go look up uh, that that Kelly Faye survey summary. Uh, there's a lot of great, great information in here. Um, when it comes to the opportunity, and we're going to get, you know, from here into specific examples uh, because a lot of this is very generalized. We're getting more into the, the specifics and the practical application now. Um, so when it comes to the brand fan alignment and those consumption commercialization areas, that's where you lead into engagement. So, you know, you and there is a, a bit of a checklist here at the end. So you've identified what your personal brand is. You've identified, you know, who your fans are and, you know, actually been able to gauge where those alignments are. Uh, you, you're starting to creatively come up with these, you know, natural points of consumption and commercialization that are derived from that. So now you actually want to engage with a third party company. So when it comes to the spectrum of the uh, corporations versus versus startups and small businesses, there are some very common uh, characteristics between those two segments, uh, looking that corporations typically want a larger brand uh, or, you know, someone with, with a, a larger presence when it comes to their talent. Um, when it comes to a fixed campaign, that that's what I was mentioning a moment ago, those are typically the insert artist XYZ or ABC here, the campaign necessarily won't charge. Uh, and while that absolutely works for some sponsorship licensing or endorsement scenarios, you want to try to find scenarios from a micro influencer standpoint where you actually can influence and have some say in the marketability. Because again, that organic alignment, not necessarily just between you and your brand and your audience, but now incorporating a, a, a third party company here is extremely important. Uh, these are traditionally short term campaigns. Uh, I mean, it could be anywhere from you know a day to a month to a year, but wh whatever the case may be, th there's typically some sort of um, you know, basis as far as a predetermined time period that's set. Obviously, campaigns can be uh, renewed for any reason, but uh, at the end of the day, uh, these are, are typically fixed and, you know, uh, certain periods of time are, are determined up front. Uh, the return on the investment from the company side typically falls at the benefit of the company over the talent or the brand. Uh, when you are looking at a scenario, you know, I've had artists that were paid, you know, uh, to stand in front of a billboard or to, you know, market a product along, you know, a, a tour, you know, and those were great scenarios. And at the time, you know, the payouts were, were amazing, especially given the size of, of that talent. Um, but what was interesting is considering that the objective exploitation of that talent and specifically their brand always lended a greater return to the company. So regardless of what check size the company would cut or if it's minimal, or I'm sorry, reoccurring payments, Typically, the company is the one seeing the benefit. Otherwise, they would not be paying for the talent and brand association. So it's something just to keep in mind that whenever you might see a quick payday, there's somebody else out there that's, that's you know, again, objectively, not necessarily in a negative way, exploiting.
developing your brand for their own gain, and that gain is more substantial than what you're seeing directly. Um, what's very interesting is if you take this and scale it over to startups or small businesses, especially on a hyper-localized level or even regionalized, um, they're much more willing to work with those micro-influencers. You're looking at smaller brands' talent. Um, you know, this can be a, a local company with a single, uh, you know, good or service offering that has a single location that's looking to target, um, you know, one artist in their market just to help scale out. Uh, and we'll get into a very specific reference which discusses this. Uh, but even on the advertising side, you know, one of, one of the companies I had, Soundster, before it was acquired, um, we were really trying to solve a problem around music licensing and helping artists get paid when their music is used, especially in a live setting. But in addition to that, we also had an advertising component. We were, we were building an, an uh, advertising network that really didn't have any limitations for anyone coming in to advertise. And I'll never forget, we had a tire company uh, in our hometown of Cincinnati that, that called us and really wanted to sponsor a hard rock show. And they basically said nobody would take their money and, and they literally just wanted to be a part of the show because they knew that was their fan base and their target demographic. So being able to lean into those more micro-influencer, smaller, local, regionalized talent, um, the startups and small businesses, especially from a local perspective, are absolutely at least willing and more likely to have those conversations, whether or not something manifests is up to a case-by-case -case scenario. Uh, the flexibility around the campaigns is extremely important as well, because it's not a one-size-fits-all that's being brought to the table. You typically have, you know, uh, companies that might have some sort of marketing assistance. They might be working with a brand or an agency, and they're looking to actually, you know, align with talent. But they're also open to the perspective of the talent because they realize that, you know, you actually do know your audience, uh, and you know, the the cement might be poor, but not necessarily dry when it comes to the, uh, you know, marketability and, and this, the the parameters of the campaign. So the flexibility of campaigns is something that's very important. Again, you know, utilizing your brand, you know, your audience getting in, having some sort of a say um, that becomes especially, you know, relevant when somebody's actually getting into the, uh, the equity positions and investing in things like that. But the third party approaches you and they're open to have a conversation about how to better uh, determine how that cam campaign will fit your audience. Absolutely be open and willing to that conversation. Uh, these are also, they, they, they can scale into much more mid and long term campaigns. The longer term you associate your personal brand with a product or service, the more engagement you're going to see from your audience. Uh, you know, the, the campaigns that are just, you know, being uh, thrown up on social media for a single post and third party companies are paying for it, that's exactly what I'm talking about when I'm saying that they typically lean more on the visibility and these uh, companies, these third party companies are not seeing as high ROI, return on investment as they would like. So the long-term brand association, integrated marketing to where you might not even know it's necessarily advertising a product, we'll get into that in a second, uh, is extremely important. So at this point, you know, the, uh, the return on the investment could benefit the company, but it also could be equally as beneficial to the talent. And there's actually some scenarios where the talent can see more of a benefit from the company, typically leans more into long-term association. If you can ne negotiate like equity-based positions or actually invest, those are absolutely, uh, you know, scenarios to look at. But the spectrum of compensation structures, you know, when you fall one side of the spectrum to the minimal uh, return or the, the short term uh, that traditionally falls to a, you know, a single payout or a flat fee, uh, could lean into a reoccurring fee, which could be more over time. Uh, and then there is this dividing line in the sand to where you can start to get into, you know, like equity based positions, things like that. Obviously, consult your, uh, your entertainment attorney and your business manager and your personal manager uh, and anyone working, you know, within your team. But uh, being able to negotiate equity is a very, very good position. And then at a certain point, looking at scenarios where you can actually either negotiate majority equity of the deal or you can negotiate uh, to invest in a company uh, and help scale that company up by leveraging your, your personal brand and associating that uh, is absolutely where you're going to see the largest payout. Uh, you know, a lot of artists here, I wish I could see all of you and, and, and get a, a view of hands. Um, so many artists are utilizing TikTok right now. And when you, you know, utilize TikTok, again, it's that one-to-one -one scenario. It's you engaging with your fans. You know, it, it's adding value to that relationship, but it is still just between you and your fans. Imagine if you could have invested in the parent company of TikTok several years ago, and then the last you know, two, three years worth of album campaigns were exclusively done through TikTok. At that point, you're seeing a much, much larger return, but it's not necessarily just when your fans engage with a platform or service that you have invested in, it's also now every single scenario of where any art, other artist that maybe you've influenced or just by proxy of uh, 
you know, uh, found their way onto the platform, uh, you're seeing a return potentially when they, when they as, as a personal brand or talent engage with that product or service that you potentially have invested in, but also when they're fans. So you're seeing a windfall come, you know, through the pipeline as far as passive income from somebody who you have no direct association with. So it's really just about having the context of that perspective. Again, there are a lot of restrictions around investment, uh, but when it comes to those conversations about those, uh, uh, you know, campaign, you know, structures uh, financially, um, you know, maybe there are certain relevant areas where you can start to discuss things like equity, even if it's a, a very minimal piece or a pathway to equity. It's really just about having that perspective is invaluable. Um, so getting into the engagement and examples as we start to wrap this here, uh, you know, just given time, um, you know, the column on the left is very broad. So I'm not going to spend as much time here because it's really about the, 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 the creative context in which it's applied. So general examples, you know, advertising, you know, sponsors, shows and tours, you know, you can do social media, uh, sponsored content. I'm just kind of, you know, uh, freely going off of this list, you know, appearances, you know, in-store branded content, product collabs, you know, giveaways, prizes, meet and greets, product reviews, reveals, launches, integrated marketing campaigns. You've probably seen majority of this on, you know, other lists or other people that are, are great when it comes to brand association and integrated marketing talking about this. And, you know, that's amazing. I'm certainly not trying to reinvent the wheel. But again, it comes to the creative context in which it's applied. So what I want to do is spend a few minutes running through. Um, I won't name the artist specifically because I don't know how far along they are in the process. I will get clearance from that artist because, you know, he is an amazing artist. I become very good friends with, you know, both him and his manager, who also happens to be his fiance. But she's she's a very great music industry executive. But I was talking with them in conversation, you know, just uh, offering some advice casually over over dinner that they had asked for. Um, and he said he has, you know, a new new album that he wants to put out. And contextually, he really wanted to have something unique about this artist. So we started talking more beyond his talent, beyond the actual music about his brand. And I found out that, you know, he's Creole. He's also a very, very passionate vegan and he's a hip hop artist. So I came up with a concept, you know, just on the fly uh, that we, we, we've actually explored since then of instead of having the medium of a collection of songs come out on whether it's, you know, digital or, uh, you know, physical on an LP or CD or whatever the case may be, you know, let's take the intersection of this Creole family, you know, background, but also his, his passion around, you know, veganism and put it into a cookbook. And just, he lit up so much when I said that, uh, because he was talking about all these amazing recipes, and you know, I, I'm very interested in trying, but looking at the scalability, again, how can we translate this from something very active to passive? So we looked at the, the concept of not only building a cookbook, but also looking at vegan or, or Creole restaurants, or even his, you know, his own, uh, creations uh, from a, a, a food standpoint, you know, popping up at his events and having them catered. These are also third parties that we can engage with, you know, his, his neighborhood here in, in, in New York um, has a lot of uh, Creole influence, but there's also a lot of, uh, of vegans in the area. So coordinating to have those third parties come, you know, pay some sort of sponsorship engagement, uh, you know, rate that they are actually paying you to associate with your brand and your audience. Um, you know, we also discussed uh, looking up local vegan and Creole shops where he could make appearances, you know, uh, having an actual listening party uh, instead of at a venue or at some sort of a hall that he rents out, actually doing it in one of those stores. Uh, I mean, there's absolutely a way to monetize that. Um, but then we really started getting creative with it, taking these recipes potentially to restaurants and having him instead of doing a music residency, looking at actually having him do like a cooking or chef residency and also having these entities incorporate custom menu options. So a lot of this is still very service-based. Um, you know, there, there, there are ways to derive this into that, that passive structure. And that's when you get into looking at third parties, you know, uh, whether that's him starting to bottle his own ingredients or looking at third party ingredient manufacturers, sponsorship endorsement or licensing their scenarios to where he can have his personal brand and his talent affixed to that. Um, you know, looking at other third party, you know, vegans or Creoles that are looking to produce recipes that intersect with him, his personal brand and his audience, you know, starting to review that. I mean, that's an, an entire separate alternative revenue stream on, you know, YouTube or whatever video app you want to use. Um, this also gives him uh, a mechanism to start you know, re raising awareness for these entities, fundraisers. Uh, th there is a lot of money when it comes to nonprofits that, you know, artists and personal brands can 
can leverage. You also can obviously donate your time and your likeness. But um, you know, it, it's it's a great way to start to build a community and then to extend from a passive standpoint, um, not only you know a return to him and his personal brand, but also to the community in general. Uh, and then third-party content marketing and lead generation is huge here. Uh, you know, how many cre uh, Creole vegans are there in New York or shops that have that intersection? Um, this is a way for him to, again, uh, leverage his personal brand and have something that impacts third parties that, again, he can generate revenue. So what it comes down to is your creativity and your personal branded content. Are, those are your key differentiators. So again, the, the column on the left here are some very general examples, but the proof is in the pudding when you actually apply your personal brand and you can get really creative. So I mean, this was a two hour conversation over dinner that now is, you know, being broadcast to, you know, to, to everyone here on this webinar. Uh, that's just one instance. So get creative, really understand your personal brand and your audience and, and get creative. So, you know, the process here, just to wrap, is looking at your personal brand and your legacy development. Again, your personal brand is what you represent. Your legacy is the impact of that brand. You know, really understanding uh, from the intelligence standpoint who your audience is, those basic consumption habits around them, researching the opportunity, what companies actually align in, in addition to that, that Venn diagram of your brand, your audience, and your influence. If you add a fourth component to that Venn diagram, what are the natural companies? Are they large corporations? Are they smaller startups that are willing to be much more flexible, uh, that are interested in micro-influencers? You know, look at the creative context for company engagement. You know, that slide that we just had with all those very unique scenarios on the right column compared to the very generalized contextual examples on the left. Once you know what companies you potentially can engage with, that's a scenario where you can start to draw those very interesting scenarios on how to actually apply that. And then in the short term, you know, some easy targets are those sponsorship licensing and endorsement scenarios. And the long term, that could open up to equity based, you know, positions with the companies you're actually investing. Um, the return on the investment of time here is, is to be able to really build value in your personal brand, uh, build a deeper connection with your audience, and also to, to generate passive, especially passive income from third party companies. And then finally, just the wrap here is the sustainable perspective is just that you know, now you have a more empowered brand that you can leverage. You have more passive income that you're seeing from these relationships. And in general, you can have a larger impact that plays absolutely into that legacy component. So I want to be respectful of time. I'm sure there's some questions that have come in. You know, that's me, uh, you know, Brian Pennick, managing partner of Legacy Entertainment Ventures. Um, you'll see a hashtag that we float around on uh, social media a lot, which is what is your legacy? And it's really starting that uh, contextual questioning of, you know, who are you? What is your brand? What does it represent? And then following through, you know, everything, your audience and, and really what you, what you want that sustainable uh, perspective to be. So with that being said, uh, I'll open it up to any questions. I know we're a little tight on time, uh, but yeah, thank you so much for having me. And hopefully this at least has the mental gears turning. Thank you so much, Brian, for your informative presentation. And uh, as he said, if you have any questions, please do submit it through the questions box on your GoToWebinar platform. Uh, and we'd like to also thank everyone today for attending. Uh, it was great having you and great uh, getting to share the information with you. Looks like we just got a question popping in now. Yeah. Do you mind handling the, the questions and throwing them my way? Sure. So first question is, can you give an example of a fee or fee range that you've seen for a campaign in the smart up, startup slash small business side? I mean, it, it's it's absolutely on a case by case scenario. It, it depends on if if you're pushing like a service or I mean a, a product or service are the two you know categories that it typically would fall into. You know, if it's a one time scenario and you're looking for the startup to just be at an event and it's you know say you're you have an event you know 500 cap room booked you know sold out uh, and you are looking. Uh, to have a startup come in, sponsor that event. Maybe it's you know something that pertains very specifically to music. Maybe it's like a piece of wearable technology or something like that. You can ask the company uh, what's known is their customer acquisition cost. So what's their their current cost to acquire new customers and price it out? They'll probably say you know a, a, a few cents up to a few dollars, uh, and then you can do that on a per head basis. Um, you know if 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 it's less tangible. Uh, not actually at an event and it's a single sponsored post. Um, you know, don't be afraid to throw out the first number because the negotiation, unless they just, you know, slam the phone down or um, I don't even know how many are you are <laughs> actually talking on landlines. Uh, don't be afraid to, you know, go go big or go home. And, th and that specific scenario, 
Um, I think, you know, a customer acquisition cost of uh, maybe $2 per head, I think a startup would see immense value in that. And if you've got 500 people at the event and it's literally just a one-off scenario, that's $1,000 right there. Uh, when it comes to, you know, any expenses when it, for marketability, you know, promoting uh, that brand alongside, like on the, the banner advertisements, on the marquee, things like that, you could factor that in. But um, I mean, how many smaller artists out there uh, that can, can draw, you know, even even less than 500 in their hometown that are working with a, a startup that's either in their hometown or looking to scale into their hometown um, wouldn't take an extra dollar or two per head. Um, so again, it's case by case. You know, if you start to throw out, you know, crazy numbers, then people might respond and think that you are crazy. But um, you can certainly try. I mean, we've, we've thrown out some large numbers with past clients and gotten away with it. And, you know, we were giggling uh, internally. And, and the relationship did, you know, provide positive ROI for the company. But at the end of the day, we started to, to really look, and this is obviously why I've derived Legacy Entertainment Ventures, in that although it was a good single payout for the company, I'm sorry, for the, for the, for the, the uh, artists, the personal brand and their talent, at the end of the day, the company saw a much larger windfall of that, uh, you know, impact from the engagement. So um, I, I know that's very little context, you know, it's not getting into, there, there are some people who have started to quantify the value of individual sponsored posts. Um, there's a lot of great references out there. So I would just get to Googling and, and see what's out there and then, you know, test the waters. The worst case scenario, somebody's going to come back with a lower number. Thank you, Brian. Uh, we got another question popping in. Can you share any resources available for your un for understanding your or similar artist fan bases? Examples being insight dashboards, public facing social media analytics, etc. So I want to make sure I'm understanding this question. When it comes to understanding your fans, are you talking more specifically about like the the objective slash subjective research on that slide? Uh, let me go back to it. Um, the characteristics, the audience intelligence, because if so, um, I mean, you could do some basic demographic research, you know, uh, for, for DMAs when it comes to marketing well beyond just music. Uh, but a lot of this is really just paying attention to your audience. Uh, once you understand some of the basics and, and a little bit of the advanced, um, you know, actually spend some time on your fan's social profiles, see what they're posting about. Um, you know, there, we, we do have some templates where you can view this for at least other artists with regard to musicians desk reference. Uh, but when it comes to that, you know, very regimented process of understanding your fans, um, I would I would look more into uh, typical uh, demographics from a marketing perspective, not so much from a music perspective. Uh, there's a lot of great resources out there. Uh, and, you know, I don't necessarily want to name. I want you I want to encourage you to go click around and, and read. Um, multiple resources. But at the end of the day, again, from a marketing, advertising, uh, and agency perspective, a lot of this content exists, but contextually it hasn't necessarily been developed into the music industry. Uh, and once you do gain this intel, this is something that's very, it's deeply personal to you and your audience. Uh, so th things might match up compared to, you know, marketability structures for, you know, third parties outside of music. Things might be completely new, unique to you and your audience. Uh, so hopefully that that answers your question. But um, it, it's really about you have to go to the the uh, the battleground of social media, if you will, and you really have to look through your fans. Um, this is something that once you start to gain intel, maybe it's something if you've got if you're a pop artist in you know uh, or a country artist in Nashville or wherever, you know maybe you can get some artists who are you know similar genre, similar size. To divide and conquer that work and then you can have some you know group intel and then market against that so hopefully that that is at least some context that's helpful well and just for reference when i do this with corporations we do it completely from scratch we have some basic context from you know uh, again that agency advertising model but we, we we start this absolutely from scratch all right uh we're just over time but if anybody has any last minute questions take about another minute um as I said, thank you again, Brian, for today's presentation, and thank you for everybody for tuning in to the Common Ground webinar series. Yeah, thank you for having me. Hopefully this was helpful, and uh, best of luck to you all in your, in your journey and your career. All right. Everyone have a great rest of your day and week. Thank you very much.